welcome back to Clearwater Jazz Holidays, Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. Our friend Brandon Robertson is back with us. Today's topic deals with the bass, how to capture a big sound. Brandon's going to help us do that. What's up, Brandon? How you doing, man? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to hear from you uh, and, and have you with us. We are recording these sessions, as we always do, for the purposes of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Our participants today are muted for the courtesy of the session, but if there are questions, we'll get those to Brandon. Check out our resources through our Education and Outreach page. We've got the studio past archive of all of these video sessions. There's some great ones in there and it's a growing wonderful treasure of information that is all free. And it's brought to you by our friends, uh, Blue Water Wealth Management at Steward Partners. And you can also listen to these sessions on a podcast called the Young Lion Jazz Master Virtual Sessions Podcast. That's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. So check out all these upcoming sessions and all these wonderful musicians and educators participating. Let me turn it over to Brandon in a second. I'm going to tell you first about him, try to make him blush a little bit. Let's see if <laughs> I can do that. So Brandon Robertson is an Emmy nominated music director, professional upright electric bassist, composer and music educator originally from Tampa. He completed his Bachelor of Arts in Music from Florida State University in 2009 and a Master of Music and Jazz Studies in the spring of 2016. Currently, he's the Director of Jazz Studies and Director of the Florida Gulf Coast University Basketball Band at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida. In 2018, Brandon was nominated for an Emmy Award for Best Documentary for Educational Collegiate Programs that featured the Florida Gulf Coast University Jazz Ensemble. As a prominent band leader, Brandon has taken his band on multiple national tours, headlining at some of the top jazz venues in the country. To add to this impressive resume, he's performed with notable acts such as the world-famous Count Basie Orchestra, led by director Scotty Barnhart, vocalist Carmen Bradford, Jason Marsalis, Marcus Roberts, Marty Morell, Wycliffe Gordon, Dan Miller, and many, many others. He's also been featured as a performer and band leader at various national jazz festivals. And if you haven't already done so, check out his first debut album entitled Based on a True Story. That was released in the fall of 2019 and reached all the way to number 16 on the iTunes Top 200 release. Yeah, baby. Brandon Robertson, <laughs> back with us. Young Lion, Jazz Master, Virtual Sessions. The stage is all yours, my friend. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hide my blushing right now. You know, my, my cheeks are cherry red. <laughs> so I appreciate the introductory. Everybody who's watching, thank you guys very much for having me back. Uh, I have enjoyed doing these sessions throughout the summertime. It has been great. It's actually been wonderful because I've gone back and looked at, back at some of these videos and I've realized how uh, value valuable they are to the, the future generation that are going to, and the future youth that are going to be watching this. So you guys are doing a great job with this platform. Thank you guys again for having me. So for today, I wanted to talk about a topic that a lot of band directors, I don't know, have had the opportunity to address with their base students. Um, I've recently came across an interesting article and I wish I, I was sitting here trying to remember what what the name were the name of that the the author or the person who wrote the article but basically it was talking about how young bass players are deceive they they are they dis, they're very um how do i say out of touch when it comes to what they sound like when they play the bass. And I thought that this article did a great job kind of just tapping into like well, how do you get a big sound? How does how does somebody practice that? You know, and I remember in my undergraduate studies that that was a struggle of mine. That my bass teacher would always tell me, it's like Brandon, you need to you need to work on getting a bigger sound. You you just sound so thin and weak." And I'm like, 
I am pulling the strings. I am pulling the strings. I don't know what you're, what, how much louder you want me to get. That's not the case. That's not actually what he was referring to. What he was talking about was the sound. See, you can pull on a string and play a mezzo forte or a double forte, but your sound can still sound bad. Your, the, 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 the sound of how long your note lasts matters, especially as a bass player. So that was the, so I'm going to cover three topics today, three pointers. Um, these three pointers might be a little bit in depth, but you can always go back and watch this so you can take your time, jot down some notes, et cetera. Point number one, right hand, left hand, okay? Your left hand is what makes the sound, your right hand is what produces the sound because if you don't pull the string, nothing comes out. But if you don't press on the string, nothing comes out. So your left hand is just as important as your right hand. Okay. One of the things that young bass players don't spend a lot of time on is perfecting their right hand technique. How do I properly pull the string? Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to step away for just a quick second. I'm going to grab my bass. I'm not going to play, but I'm going to demonstrate for you exactly what I mean by when you pull the sound. I'm going to show you two techniques that are wrong and one technique that is right. Okay, so I'm going to show you two, two that are wrong and one that is right. Okay, so... Can you all hear me? Okay. Here is technique number one that is wrong when I'm speaking in terms of pulling the string with your right hand. That's a big no-no. Number two, tech, uh, technique number two that will also be wrong. That is also wrong. The difference between what I just did with those two are number one, the first one, we call this the duck hand. This is when you're flapping across the string and all you're getting is just a distortion of vibrating noises. That's all you hear with the duck hand. Technique number two, we call this the acoustic hand shape, which in an orchestral setting would be correct. In jazz, no one's going to hear you if you're pulling the string like this, right? So the right way is what I'm going to show you the first time. So here's what you want to do for everybody. And this is also good information for band directors to know when you're working with middle school bass players. This is essentially for a bass player who is in middle school because that's essentially where the issue is. You usually have a sixth grader who gets put on an instrument that they A, are learning for the first time or they have already been introduced to but they haven't had enough knowledge given to them or explained to them. So if you're a middle school director and you have a full rhythm section, I would encourage you to push and encourage your bass player to play upright and not electric. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with playing electric bass in the, in the jazz band, but the upright bass is the proper instrument for that setting. It also has a more of an innate sound that is blend that blends better with the rest of the acoustic instruments in the ensemble. So going back to your right hand, this matters because when you place your hand on the fingerboard, your thumb is what's the anchor. This is the anchor. Okay. Your thumb is the anchor. You're going to place your thumb here on the side of the, on the side of the fingerboard. And you're going to pick your hand up. So your hand, if I move the microphone first, I'm going to move the microphone for a second. Like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the difference between the third time and the first two times is the note actually rings. And as a bass player, your notes need to ring. They always need to project and ring and play over the bar line. And what I mean by that is if you're playing a blues, if I, if I were to play an F blues, if I were to go through those three steps, those three techniques in my right hand, and you can hear the difference of the note value. So this is what I'm going to give you. First example, I'm going to use the duck hand. Try to play an F blues. Now, you can clearly hear that you can't hear me. You also, you cannot hear the, <laughs> you can't hear the notes ringing. You can't feel the actual pulse of the quarter note moving. That's important. That's what happens when you have the duck hand. Now, here's what happens when, when you have the acoustic hand, which I would have called the, a classical approach. Now, the difference between that one and the first time is you actually can hear the notes, but again, it's so soft because you're not letting the notes ring. And when it doesn't ring, you will have a lot of very upset horn players because they're turning around and they can't feel the bottom. So here's what you do. This is the third way with the proper technique. Put your hand on the this, on this fingerboard. Have your full hand like, like this, the shape that I have it, just like this, and you're putting it on right on top of the fingerboard. When you do that, your wrist now becomes what I call a springboard, and it, it, make, it emulates the motion of a doorknob. So when you're turning, your note, when you pull against the string down, the note will actually ring, and it'll ring longer. So example. You can actually feel. Sit this here. Okay. So now you can actually feel the bottom. Okay. The right hand is very important. I wanted to demonstrate that because sometimes that gets overlooked. I see a lot of band directors at some of the schools that I visited and have worked with that their bass players spend a lot of time making sure that their left hand is together, but then I can't hear them. So they have this beautiful technique in their left hand, but they're not pulling the string on their right hand. So now the left doesn't know what the right is doing and the right has no clue what the left is doing. So you always want to make sure that you are in, you're, you're, you're in sync the entire time. Excuse me. So now let's go to point number two. Point number two, the left hand. I just gave this example uh, to another, uh, another class that I've done recently. Take a soda bottle, a water bottle, in this case, this nice Florida State Yeti. And I want you to hold it, okay? So if you're watching this, I want you to hold your cup. Now, as you can see, the circumference of this cup, right, emulates and makes the same shape in my left hand. If I were to remove this and I flip my hand up on the screen, this is the shape I have. A nice C, or I like to call it the Coca-Cola shape. Okay. Now on an upright bass, imagine if this is the, this is the neck of the bass, right? 
when you take that C shape, your hand will look something like this, all right? You want your fingers on top of the string, not flat, not inside of the string, not under the string, on top of the string. You have to place your fingers on top. That is what makes your sound, not produces the sound, it makes your sound. If you do not press down on the string, you get a buzzing. And everybody who's watching it, especially band directors, you've at some point of time have heard your bass player hit the buzz. I did it in high school. I remember my band teacher yelling at me, telling me, Brandon, press harder on the string. It hurts. Well, if you don't, you're going to keep buzzing. And I didn't know what he meant by that until I went to college and my teacher explained to me that the tension from your fingers actually is what makes the sound. So if you have less weight on the string, it's going to buzz. You're going to get the zzz, 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 zzz. you're going to get that sound. But if you press down too hard, you're doing what we call choking the sound, which then it it kind of like capsizes how long that note will last. So it almost kind of like you're muting or playing it like a ghost note. Okay. So you want to make sure there's a fine balance. I always like to use the rule of thumb that however much weight you put on top of the string in your right hand should be the same weight in your left hand. Okay. So everything is even. You want everything to sound even together. All right. Going back to your left hand with this C shape. The distance between your index and your pinky is important. When people see an upright bass, they think they got to spread their fingers all the way around, out like this. That is incorrect. You don't have to do that, okay? If you, if you have young, uh, for directors, if you have young bass players who come from an electric bass background, I have a lot of students who started out on electric before they switched to upright. The transfers are very, very doable, and they're similar. The transfers from electric to upright are very similar, especially in terms of where the, where the position is. The only difference between the acoustic and that electric, with the obvious of being the size, is it's fretted. An acoustic bass is a fretless bass versus an electric bass, if you don't play on a fretless electric, is usually fretted. So I tell my young bass students, picture yourself playing electric bass horizontally, or I'm sorry, or, ver or vertically, excuse me, and you're doing the exact same shape that you would do like this. You're just now, instead of going like this, you're going like this. So once I explain it to them like that, they usually can get it. So you wanna make sure that their hand shape is proper in terms of that spacing between the index and the ring finger, I'm sorry, the index and the middle finger, your ring finger to your pinky. Make sure that space is even, okay? Make sure that the, the top of the knuckles, if you can see here my knuckles, my knuckles are pointing up. You want the knuckles to be pointing up and not down. This will be pointing down, completely flat. That's when you'll get the you'll you you'll get that nasty out of tune intonation issues, right? But when you lift the fingers up on the fingerboard, or, I'm sorry, on the strings, and you point the knuckles out, that keeps that arc shape in your left hand. It also takes away it takes away the tension that you would get in the middle of your palm. Most of the tension in your left hand comes right here. Because when you press, when you're pressing behind the neck of the base, your thumb is the what's imp, it's imprinting all that that pressure, in, in in a very short amount of space. So you don't want to sit there and dig your thumb in the back of the neck because all of this is going to tighten up. This this is one tendon right here. This one tendon is connected to all the tendons here in your forearm. So every if, and I always hear this from a lot of young bass players that their hand, their left hand hurts and it usually hurts right here because this one tendon in your thumb is connected to that big muscle that I forget what this muscle is called, but this is one long muscle here that's connected to your forearm that goes right here. So when you press on it hard enough, you start to feel, that's why a lot of times when bass players play, they feel their forearm is locking up or their left hand will lock up. 
that's what that is because that muscle is being there's so much tension on that muscle. So in order to relax it and not build that kind of tension, you need to make sure you're not playing with the flat fingers and you're not digging your thumb in the back of the neck. Okay. My last point, and this is the one that I feel that needs to be addressed. How do you practice creating and working towards a big sound playing a lot of long tones? Okay. So, one example of that is pull the string and see how long you can let that string ring. I have a, 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 a six to seven second rule that my note should ring at least six or seven seconds. Okay. And if you, if I say six seconds, right, that would be one and a half space per note that I'm implying between the measures, okay? If I'm, let's say, doing half notes, right? Your half note wants to sound a little longer than your quarter note. Your quarter note wanna sound a little longer than your eighth note. And even to some degree, your eighth notes need to be slightly longer than your 16th because the, the more you start subdividing, the shorter your notes are going to become when you're playing them. We all know that from just, just playing simple rhythms, right? Especially when you have articulations. Even when you have articulation markings in your parts, such as if you have a marcato or, you know, or accent, or if you have a rooftop, it still implies the same. There's, you still have to give that note its full value. So on bass, that is the same principle that we would do when we're pulling the string, okay? Three things that you can do. One, practice long tones. Open strings without any notes, just with your right hand, just pulling the string and setting your metronome at 60 BPM. Do it really slow because you really want to try your best to get the feel. I always teach my students, one thing that a band director cannot teach you is feel. We cannot teach you that. I can't teach you that. I can teach you how to listen for, I can teach you how to listen for those type of things, but I can't teach you how to create that because every individual has a different approach. We all have different internal clocks. Our hearts all beat, but we all beat different rhythms. If we all beat the same rhythm, we would all walk the same. We would all move the same, right? But that's not the case. So, Playing those long tones and playing them really slow really is teaching you how to feel that note and feel the vibration from your bass. I was taught that if I don't feel the vibration coming from my bass, then I'm not producing a big sound. There's nothing coming out of my instrument because your instrument is your voice. So since, we're play, since we play an instrument that has a much lower frequency, it is way easier for somebody to not hear you and you get overshadowed versus if you really have good control in your sound and you play out, they'll get it. They'll be able to hear it without you even trying. Okay. Number two, aside from playing long tones, um, bowing, work on playing a scale very slowly with no vibrato, but work on getting the sound to last. So what happens sometimes is we'll be playing something and then eventually we start to get quieter and people have always wondered, why does that happen? That's because your endurance is starting to, to go down. And when your endurance start to go down, you're getting winded. You're going to start playing a lot softer to try to build your immune up. You're going to try to try to get yourself back into it because if you're getting winded, you're getting tired, you're getting restless. That means you're going to slow down and you don't want to slow down. So you start playing quieter to try or softer to try to keep up. What that does is that actually makes you more tired. So I wouldn't do that. All right. What I would suggest is take the bow, play a scale, play it very slow and work on trying to keep that sound consistent. Okay. Cause sometimes when we're playing a, a pizzicato, our sound will sound consistent one way. And then when we start bowing, it sounds completely different. Okay, so you just want to make sure that you're staying consistent, all right, with your bowing. And lastly, the one thing that you can do to help create your uh, create bigger sound, listen to other bass players who have big sounds. 
and try to emulate that. Okay, one of the one of the uh, one of my favorite bass players who actually was a residence at one point in St. Petersburg, Mr. Mr. Sam Jones. Sam Jones is probably one of my favorite basses that has one of the most humongous sounds throughout throughout jazz bass history. And after listening to a lot of Sam Jones, I realized that he has a hump. We call it it's like a thud, a big hump in his playing and i try my best every single time i play bass to emulate that hump and the closer i get to it the more people will always come to me and they'll ask me man are you amplified and i'm like nope and they're like i mean how are you how are you doing that and i usually would tell people they think it's from a practice technique i tell them i i, I listen to a lot of bass players that have big sounds so that's so that sound is in my ear so I know what I'm listening for when I play so if I'm not capturing that I'm going to do something in real time to fix that okay so that would be my that's kind of my approach uh of how do I go about creating a bit sound and um your sound is your voice you know like the way I'm talking to you all right now if I talk like you wouldn't hear me. You would be like, this guy's, this guy's a joke. I don't know what he's doing. Can't, can't keep up. But when you speak loud or not loud, excuse me, when you speak with control, when you know how to control the volume in your voice and you know how to get your point across without yelling or without being very reserved, you know, you, if you know how to be, find that middle ground, you always get your point across. So the same thing comes with, with your sound on bass. If you find a middle ground with your sound, no matter what you do or whatever circumstances or situations you're in, whether you have an amp or with, without an amp, or if you're playing outside or inside of a venue, it shouldn't matter. Your sound is your sound. And that's what people will recognize. And, uh, and that's all I have for today. I think that's, uh, I just dropped some jewels on you. Yeah, it was a great session, Brandon. Some really good stuff. Hey, do you have any words of encouragement for a, a, a maybe a young lion new to new to a base? You were talking about like at the middle school level, or even someone later in life that's trying to pick it up. Uh, it's such a unique instrument. What kind of words of encouragement do you have for someone to stick with it and try to get there? Trust the process. That's it's, it's 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 so simple and cliche, but that is so much truth to that. Trust the process. Uh, a lot of people steer away from paying, playing bass because of the the process it takes to actually being able to master the instrument. Um, you can learn trumpet within a couple of months. You know, you can you can actually learn violin within a couple of months. Uh, you can learn saxophone within a couple of months. But it's something about the acoustic bass because of the nature of its in, of the instrument itself. It's so big. It has a very large neck. The strings are a lot thicker than they would be on a cello or a violin or viola. Um, it's 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 a lot more weighted. So you know you're having to carry the thing, and you know, and and then if like you're you look awkward when you're first playing it, you're like you're kind of like a, a skeleton. Like if you had a skeleton trying to hold the bass, it'll be all like this. You know, it just looks it just looks bizarre, right? Um, but it's not until you play your first scale correct. I kid you not. I was in fifth grade when I first started playing bass. My teacher kept trying to teach me to play C major. I screwed that. Oh, my gosh. I, poor Miss Bishop. How many times that that lady had to sit there and listen to me play, Uh, what was it, A, the note A? I played that note out of tune every single time for weeks. I just could not play A correctly. My hand just would not hit. It would hit A flat. It wouldn't hit A. And she would just come in there, and she would smile, and she says, you're going to get it, Brandon. Don't worry. Keep practicing. I'm like, I'm tired of this. This sucks. I don't want to do this no more. And she's like, just keep doing it. She's very calm with me. Very calm and patient with me. And then the day I got it, I said, wow, the feeling. It was like, I felt like I had mastered the bass. I was like, yo, I'm ready to play anything now. And then, but it was that, it was a moment where it clicked. It just clicked. It was like, that's how I do it. And I never forgot that. I've never, I was 10 years old when I, when it clicked, I, when it clicked, 
I never forgot how to play a C major scale. And I remember what I did right. And I just did that on all the other scales. And then I just kept going. So the words of encouragement is once you achieve the first step, you're going to keep going. And you have to trust the process. The process, the process is so worth it at the end. It's so worth it at the end. Once you're able to obtain all of this information and knowledge and skills, because it's a skill that you probably didn't have before. Now you have it. So the more you start to master things and they are able to do things that you like and enjoy, then that's where the fun part comes in. So just keep at it. Just trust the process. That's my advice. Thank goodness for the Miss Bishops in the world, right? Whoo! Yes, man. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. That, I that, wish. What? Yeah. Now that's awesome. That's great advice and great words of encouragement. Um, we're we're really, you know, so grateful you're part of this, and we've got you coming back on August the 25th for the Jazz yes. Bowling class. Yes. And then on yeah, September third. September 3rd, sort of like a, 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 I think we're calling that one understanding the sound of jazz. It's kind of like a mm-hmm. jazz history kind of approach to that one, right? Yeah. And what I'm going to do, um, I'm actually, I, I came up with the concept for that. I'm actually going to present what I did in graduate school, what I wrote my dissertation on, which was the uh, historical lineage on jazz bass players. So I picked a bass player from each decade and I spoke about how that bass player had an influence on that specific time period. And I purposely picked bass players that weren't the normal choices. You would not hear me talk about Ron Carter, respects to Ron. You would not hear me talk about Ray Brown, respects to Ray Brown. You would not hear me Talk about Paul Chambers, respects to Paul Chambers. I picked bass players that I knew people didn't really talk about as often, but their roles were humongous within the jazz idiom. Like Percy Heath. No one talks about Percy Heath. Percy Heath, to me, was one of the founding uh, essential bass ch- or bass players that was able to cross over between classical and jazz with the modern jazz quartet. They played through composed classical pieces in a jazz format. Richard Davis, no one talks about Richard Davis. Richard Davis played in symphonies. He teaches at at one of the colleges up there in the Midwest. He did a full classical concerto concert with uh, with the bass player, uh, the the bass maestro himself, Gary, Gary Carr. And these are things that nobody talks about. You know, and I found that through my research, I was so intrigued by this that even with when I mentioned Sam Jones earlier, I picked Sam Jones in my dissertation because Sam Jones was one of the only few bass players that was legitimately gigging on cello. Ron Carter did a few albums on cello, but he wasn't gigging like that the way Sam Jones was and made it popular. Was one of the only few bass players that made playing cello popular in jazz. You know, so that's kind of what I'm going to go with that route and that topic, uh, talking about the the history and how bass players have made an impact, you know? Yeah, yeah. very cool. So, you know, thanks for always leaving us with a lot to think about and for not only those participating today, but future viewers and listeners and also a lot to look forward to. We're really... uh, um, uh, looking forward to you coming back on those other classes. So we want to give a shout out as we always do to the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association for helping to expand the reach of these sessions, including mm-hmm. the one today. And to all our other partners out there, thanks for believing in the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation mission of education and outreach. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone on the next time. So, Brandon, thanks again, man. Uh, stay safe out there. Uh, go get a go get a nap. You earned it today, Brandon. Oh man, I'm about to. I've been teaching straight all through today, so I'm z z z. All right, all right, everybody, uh, be well out there and keep playing. We'll see you soon. All right, guys, take care. Have a good one.